Our third presentation is titled Intramuscular Midazolam, Olanzapine, Ziprazidone, or Haloperidol for Treating Acute Agitation in the ED, presented by Lauren Klein of Hennepin County Medical Center. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Okay. I'm Lauren Klein from Hennepin County Medical Center. I'd like to thank SAM for giving me the opportunity to present this research. Today, we're going to be talking about intramuscular midazolam, olanzapine, ziprazidone, or haloperidol for treating acute agitation in the emergency department. So agitation is a common problem. We see and treat this every day in our EDs. It can be dangerous to the patient, it can be dangerous to the providers, and it can delay or preclude completely a thorough evaluation of the patient to try to determine what the underlying cause of their agitation is in the first place. So how do we treat this in the ED? Sometimes verbal escalation techniques can work. There's also sometimes easily reversible causes. For example, giving dextrose to a patient who has hypoglycemia. Oftentimes, however, this is unsuccessful and we have to consider using medications. So what is the existing evidence? There are several comparative effectiveness trials out there. Most of these yield from a group out of Australia. They're all well-performed, high-quality RCTs. However, there are some concerns with their generalizability. For one, most of these trials use droperidol as a steady arm. Now, if you're practicing emergency medicine in North America, there's been a national droperidol shortage since 2013, so unless you're compounding it in your own institution, you're unlikely to have access to it. Second, IV olanzapine is used in several of these trials. There is some data out there to suggest that this is safe and probably effective in treating agitation. However, it's not currently FDA approved, so most of us are not gonna have access to this as well. And third, and finally, perhaps my biggest concern with the literature is that most of these trials are using IV administration of sedatives. Perhaps that works in some institutions, but I don't know about you all. I can't imagine putting IVs on all the agitated patients in my hospital. So we thought we should go ahead and study medications that were available to us, medications that we use regularly, and routes that are practical for use. Which brings us to our study. So in preparation for this study, we had to decide what we were going to do about informed consent. We all know that clinical research requires informed consent, but can agitated patients truly consent to clinical research? In our opinion, the answer to this is emphatically no. So if you cannot obtain informed consent, you have two options. You can use exception from informed consent, or you can use a waiver of informed consent. When you use exception from informed consent, or EFIC, you have to go through several steps. You have to obtain or perform community consultation. You have to perform public disclosure. And you also have to submit an investigational new drug application to the FDA. So we went through all of these steps, including our IND submission to the FDA. But unfortunately, the FDA was unwilling to approve our protocol. They cited several concerns. The actual response letter from them is many, many pages long. But here are some of the highlights. To summarize, one, they do not necessarily think that agitation is a potentially life-threatening pathology. Two, they think that agitated patients may be able to perform consent. And three, they thought that there would be alternative methods to obtain consent if unavailable. Now, needless to say, our research group did not agree with this sentiment, but after many, many phone calls and emails with them, we just accepted the fact that we were gonna have to come up with an alternative to execute this study without using EFIC. So we decided to go ahead and use a waiver of informed consent. So we initiated a department-wide protocol that dictated how all of our agitated patients would be treated. So essentially, we'd be performing an observation of this protocol as an observational type of study. We had full support of all of the emergency physicians and full support of our IRB to proceed like this, such that all agitated patients in our ED had would, would, would receive initial treatment with a pre-specified medication. So for three weeks, all patients would receive initial treatment with Haldol 5 milligrams, and for the next three weeks, all patients would receive initial treatment with Ziprazidone, for th and so on and so forth for all the medications that you see listed. All subsequent treatment decisions were at the discretion of the ED provider. The only exclusions to this protocol was an allergy to the medication 
or another specific contraindication at the discretion of the, at the treating physician. So we recognize that this is not an RCT. This is an observation of clinical practice. But we had no convenience sampling. Every patient in our department was subject to this protocol. So given the constraints that were provided to us by the FDA, we felt as though this was the best option to minimize our differences between groups and minimize our potential for bias. This is what our protocol generally looked like. We had trained research associates collecting data 24 hours per day, seven days per week. They would observe for when the medication was given at time zero, and they would collect data at 15 minute intervals thereafter. Each assessment included calculation of the altered mental status scale score, and they also recorded whether or not any additional treatments were given in the previous interval. The altered mental status scale score, or the AMSS, is a agitation severity score. It ranges from minus four to plus four, where a minus four is the most sedate and plus four is the most agitated. We also collected data on time to adequate sedation in real time using stopwatches. Our primary outcome was the AMSS score at 15 minutes, and this was determined a priority. We analyzed this as a proportion of patients adequately sedated. Our secondary outcomes included the AMSS at each time point up until 120 minutes, rescue sedation or additional treatments given, time to adequate sedation, and then a variety of safety outcomes. Here are our results. We enrolled 747 patients total. You can see the distribution of the groups up on the slide. There were no significant differences in baseline characteristics identified between each group. Here are the results of our primary outcome. The top line just confirms and shows you all that we did in fact have baseline AMSS scores that were the same in each group. The bottom line shows you the proportion of patients adequately sedated at 15 minutes. You can see that midazolam resulted in the highest proportion of patients at 71%. So there's a lot of information on this slide, but I think that this is the information that you're all really interested in. So the first line shows you that midazolam compared to olanzapine, midazolam had 9% more patients adequately sedated, but this relationship based on the 95% confidence interval of that difference was not quite significant. The next three lines show you that midazolam performed better than zeprazidone and haloperidol at both doses. The next line shows you that olanzapine and zeprazidone performed similarly, but the trend did towards olanzapine being more effective in regards to our primary outcome. The next four lines show you that olanzapine performed better than haloperidol at both doses, and zeprazidone also performed better than haloperidol at both doses, and the two haloperidol doses were essentially the same. Here are some of our additional outcomes. Time to adequate sedation was the shortest for midazolam, but it did require the most number or the largest number of additional treatments. Up to 40% of patients received additional treatment for their agitation. However, you can see most of this was actually given after adequate sedation achieved, which implies that they were receiving the sedation after they re-aroused after their initial, initial sedation. Here are some of our safety outcomes. You can see there's quite a few zeros on this slide. These drugs were generally found to be relatively safe in our population. We had two cases of dystonia, no cases of acacia were noted, no cases of torsades or any other tachydysrhythmias. We did have several patients that were hypoxemic and several that did require endotracheal intubation. However, the differences between the groups were no, not substantial. So in summary, midazolam resulted in significantly lower AMSS scores at 15 minutes compared to ziprazidone and haloperidol at 5 and 10 milligrams. Midazolam resulted in lower AMSS scores at 15 minutes compared to olanzapine, but this difference was not quite significant. So why was it not significant? It's certainly possible that the two are truly equivalent, but I more suspect that we were actually underpowered to detect this difference. When we powered the study, we used data from ziprazidone and droperidol from a previous investigation in our hospital. It turns out that olanzapine may have outperformed our expectations, so we were likely underpowered in this regard. Olanzapine resulted in significantly lower AMSS scores compared to haloperidol, and additional sedation was acquired most often from midazolam, mostly given after the adequate sedation was achieved, so providers using this medication may need to anticipate this arousal. This also fits with the pharmacokinetics of the drug. And that is all we have today. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.
Uh, we welcome questions. Over here. Please. Uh, Jeremy Brown from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I really applaud you on this study. I tried to do the same thing many years ago, uh, looking at exactly the same question. And for one reason or another, we, we, we were, the, uh, the funding from uh, the organization that was running our study was pulled. So I, we didn't get to the answer. And thank you for getting to the answer. But I suggest that getting a patient adequately sedated quickly is not really the primary goal of what we should be doing. We need to figure out also how to get that patient evaluated and then discharged or admitted. So my question to you is, have you looked at the difference, if there is any difference, between uh, those treatment arms and the length of time it took for the emergency department encounter or the length of time, and this was an outcome that we were looking at, the length of time until that patient was ready perhaps for psychiatric uh, uh, evaluation. You showed us we can do it quickly, but what are the, the other endpoints? Thank you. Yeah, we actually do have, can I advance again? There you go. There you go. So I believe you're asking about time and department essentially. We did look at time and department for each arm. Now, needless to say, again, this was not powered to detect this outcome, but it did appear, those are, those are the times as you can see here. Now, this is gonna be complicated by multiple doses of medications and other psychosocial factors that could influence time and department, but these are the results of your question I believe you were asking. Maura Kennedy. Oh, that doesn't work. Does this work? Maura Kennedy, Mass General Hospital. Um, it looked like your mean age or median age was about 40. Do you know what proportion of your patients were geriatric? And do you have any information on the duration of sedation in the geriatric population? Those starting doses are higher than what you would expect to give in a geriatric patient with that sort of go slow, start low, go slow um, uh, adage. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think agitation in the geriatric population is definitely an understudied area of research. I don't have an exact proportion of patients that were over, over 65, roughly. Um, it was a, a small minority of our patients. Now, because this was a, clinic, you know, it was a clinical ED protocol, we certainly did not dictate to the providers if they felt that there was a contraindication, as I previously mentioned, because of the patient's age to not use that dose or that medication. That was certainly at their discretion. But I agree, a modified treatment plan may also be appropriate in that population. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you, Lawrence. A terrific study.